Hey guys, me again, Orksler. What is sorry last left off? Let's see, check, check, checking. Where we last left off on? What if Bell was a fume knight? So, I know it's been a while since I've updated this, and I've been going over. Yeah. Stop it, dog. And I think I'm gonna make my own endings for this series. Because I don't think it's really feasible. Because I also know there's uh, many, many more seasons to come for Dan Machi. There's a lot there and stuff like that, and a lot of characters too that I won't pro that I won't really be able to remember. So, sorry if you wanted me to stick closer to the storyline. Uh, as for what if? Issei had the Chaos Flame. I will be going back to that after this video. Hopefully more quickly this time. Again, sorry for the long wait. Anyways, here's What If Bell was well, a Fume Knight. A little quick rundown of what happened. Bell stats main guy. I didn't give him a name yet. But he essentially has arrived in Orario and is now looking for Bell, or Rame, as he knows his name to be. He doesn't quite know where he is at, but he's gonna be searching the city for now. Gonna be looking for him, trying to like pick up on his trail. As for what Bell was doing in this video, he and actually Wolf Crozo met up. And they sort of, after Bell helped Wealth get down to the lower floors, since Bell is a relatively strong powerhouse at the moment, with, for the level that he is. There are still many people above him, like, yeah, there are still a lot of people above him, but a lot of the lower ranks, I'll say, aren't able to really keep up with him as well, as they really could be. That's thanks to some of his special skills and a little bit of power that Nadalia is giving him, right? Yeah, Nishandra, Nadalia. Nadalia's the one. Yep, sorry, I just had to make sure I had the name right. Nadalia, though, has been taunting Belle a little bit as well, since she sort of started poking at him about how the futility of mankind, how it's like completely able to be fallen. And how it's weak and humanity will always backstab itself. Bell didn't necessarily disagree, but he also acknowledged that there's also the good parts of humanity. The part where a random stranger would run out to risk his life to save like a kid. Is how he thinks about it. Sure, there is bad with humanity. He accepts that 100%. But he also said, thinks that the moment that they're, that good people really stop trying to do good, that's when humanity really has fallen so low that really shouldn't be allowed to exist anymore. He believes that and pushes that as his belief, really. Nadalia was frustrated because he, had, he actually accept, accepted to take wealth to the lower levels. Good that's come out of this is he's getting a little bit of an upgrade to his straight sword that he has. As well as he's going to be able to have somebody take care of his armor. Since that's, you know, Wolf's old deal. He is the blacksmith. As I'm going to continue on and just say eventually Bell is able to get Wolf and Lily together. Sort of, so that way the three of them can party together. And for those who've forgotten, Lily has had her debt forgiven. And it was thanks to Bell that it really happened. He went pretty much straight to, uh, not Dionysus, but, um, Soma. And he was able to convince Soma to allow them to essentially let Lily leave his familia. The reason why, if you guys are asking me, he was able to sort of, like, in a way, he was able to sort of send out his emotions in a weird way to let everybody know that if they mess with him, he would quite literally kill them. So that's why there wasn't admit as many people, like, stopping him, if you guys were wondering. 
but I digress. To continue on with the story, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Monster Festival. But before I do that, I'm going to inform you a little bit of what Val Stats little boy is doing at the moment. He's looking around town asking for somebody named Rame, and he actually describes him that he has a raven, he's very tall, wears dark armor, has a raven with a shield on it, as well as he's very, not lonesome, but he rather sticks to himself and is quite quiet. They say they have a couple of adventurers that match that description, and it doesn't really narrow down anybody really the only distinct figure thing about him is the shield and they say they haven't seen anybody with a shield like that at this point he's wandering from familiar to familiar just to see if he's in them because he has heard about how the familiars work in Aurario and he's figuring if Bell was gonna go anywhere it would be to one of them to maybe gain power of some kind He's making his way through the city. He's going door to door to door to door. He eventually makes it to the Loki familiar through some weird way. And as he's like approaching their gates, you actually see where the, the standard group you see. You see Bell, not Bell. You see Well, no, freaking Wealth either. You say you see Bet, Tion, Tiana, and Eyes. You see the group of them returning after going to the dungeon for a little while. You also see the blonde small dude. I forget his name. Uh, it's slipping my mind right now, so I'm sorry about that. And that's also why it's hard for me to do this series, is because I gotta remember so many more names than just, you know, My Hero Academy. But sure, there's more characters, but their names are simple. It took me, like, multiple tries to remember Tion and Tiana alone. Bet is simple as well as eyes. She, they're like both somewhat main characters as well as remembering the gods is pretty easy as well. Same thing with Wealth, Lily, and Bell. Easy. And Hestia. But I digress. Ugh. It can, as he actually approaches them and asks about this figure and asking if he's in their familia. Bet is sort of done doing the cocky thing, and Tion and Tiana are kind of intrigued by the guy. But through his very serious demeanor, they're sort of put off by him. Eyes looks at him just like with her blank stare, and it's actually up to the captain. I'll just call him Captain for now, because that is his title in the Familia. He is the captain of the Familia. As he speaks... Ah, uh, we don't know anybody by the name of Rain, my friend, but there is a bell here, except he doesn't carry any giant sword or giant shield with a raven on it, as you see. It's a giant, it's a massive great sword, almost as big as you, as that causes, I <laughs> never gave him a name. I'll just say the messenger. That causes a messenger to somewhat pause as he questions himself. Giant sword. It seems he really is trying to regain more power to overthrow Nadalia. As he, like I said before, he is somewhat frustrated that Velstat is even having the messenger find Bell, but he really can't argue against him because. Well, it's just really how it is. He's just upset that he has to do it. Because he doesn't really hold a lot of kindness for Bell. As well, as, aside from like, you know, the whole quote-unquote quote coup attempt, it was also because of his lack of belief in the gods. And since Bell ran to a city full of gods, he pretty much wants to call Bell a hypocrite. But that really isn't his place to do so at the moment. So... He bows his head and thanks him for the information, so that way it'd be a lot easier to track down Bell. As he was about to leave, you actually have Loki come out of nowhere with a thing from of Soma's like poor wine, as she would call it. 
as she starts talking with her captain, she notices immediately the messenger, and she is intrigued, to say the least. Through her eyes, she's able to see that he has a very high amount of holy power. Like his miracles and stuff. He has a lot of them just by the feeling of him. <sighs> and most gods have the ability to somewhat feel potential of adventurers or maybe adventurers that could join them. As he's, she sort of sees him, it's like, now who are you, big guy? As she, again, like I said, can feel the somewhat holy power from him. She's like, it's been a long time since we got a new face around here. Messenger's just like, just looking for somebody. I'll be out of your hair soon. She's like, now, now, hold on a moment. Aren't you gonna ask who I am? What I am? She sort of, like, gives a coy little smile. Bell sort of, not Bell, the messenger just sort of just shakes his head. He's like, I'm not here for you, God. I'm here to find somebody. And now I have the at information. So he goes to turn and walk away. Well, you're looking for that Bell boy. I know which familia he's part of. As she's like sort of checking her fingers, he's just like, he turns around real, real quick and actually steps close to her. It's like, you must tell me now. And like, as the rest of her family actually tenses at this belligerent fool, as they would call him, stepping to their goddess, she's like, now, now, big guy. And she just sort of, huh, sorry. She sort of takes this moment, she's like, mm, no, I don't think I'm gonna. And as he's about to reach down and grab at her, freaking the captain comes around and jumps down and pushes his hand to the ground with one of his spears. As he's like, no, my friends. As he gives a dangerous little smile, he's like, do you think that is truly wise in this moment? As you know, or as you may not know, putting your hands on a god is quite a big offense, lest you be another god. Which I suspect you ain't. As the messenger just sort of, sort of gives a little growl and like yanks his hand back. As each of them are a little surprised that he was able to pull his hand from out, un, from out, from underneath the captain's spear. It's not his spear tip, but more like the, like, butt of the staff. As they're all a little bit surprised, even though the captain wasn't, like, you know, slamming his staff down, it was still a little surprising to find that somebody was able to do it so easily. Especially if they're not part of any familia, as they suspect. He's just like, I don't care for this dawdling. I believe that's the word, yes, dawdling. But I'm probably wrong. So, I'll, so, shall say, I don't need to stand around here and wait for this god to tell me no to the question she posed the answer to. I need to find Belle Cranell. Or Bell, as he would call him. He is needed. My lord calls for him. And he will f answer. As he leans down to look. Luca? I, was it Luca? Uh, I don't know. The mess, but the captain in the face. So, if your god holds the answer, she better tell me. Because I do not have the patience he sort of takes a stomp as a little bit of holy energy starts flowing through him and into his hammer. As he lifts it up and puts it on his shoulder, I do not have the patience for this dilly-dallying. She's like, well, big guy, it just so happens our healer was kind of struck out when they were harmed severely. It will take them quite a few bit of time to regain their strength. What I need is somebody who can perform such miracles. And from what I can feel, you are quite powerful in the divine aspect. As he just sort of gives a snore, he's just like, I am second only to Velstat, the high, lo high, lo pre high priest lord. As he's like, I am only second to Velstat, the archpriest. 
Only he surpasses me in faith. As Loki just sort of nods her head, he's like, yes, yes. But I still need that rule filled. So, you give me the information I need. Or you help assist us for at least, at the very least, a week or so. And I shall grant you the information of where Bell Cornell resides. Because I will tell you this. You could spend months looking and you may have never found him. Not even once. As he sort of grits his teeth and takes a moment to understand this as he let his holy power sort of die down a little bit. He's questioning himself, should he really make this deal with this trickster, as he would call her? As he's running it through his mind, he's like... <sighs> as he nods his head and sort of strucks out, sticks out his hand to Loki, he's like... You have a deal. She's like, grand! Now, let's go inside, shall we? There is an order to these things, and I can't simply make you a familiar member out here. As, they, as he nods his head and walks behind her, well, everyone else sort of just stares at this, because they're like, why the hell would she bring somebody like this disrespectful outsider, as they would call him, this disrespectful outsider into their home? Captain says... Do not worry about it. I trust Loki and she seems to know what she's doing. As for the rest of this, let's just continue on, shall we? As they all went back to enter the house. Or more like the manor. Yeah, I believe it's more like a manor. As we cut over to Belle a couple, like a week, a few days later, as the monster festival is beginning now. He promised Welf and Lily that they'd be free to be able to not go adventuring that day since everybody wanted to enjoy the festival. And since this was actually free time for Lily not to worry about that, <sighs> well, and Welf was eager to like do some selling and stuff like that since he does own the blacksmith place he has. And Belle had actually agreed to take Lily and Hestia out to enjoy their time. As Belle and them were hanging out, waiting around, you get a sneaky character in the back, aka Freya. As Freya is still interested in Belle and his unique soul, she sees the clear, somewhat clear, but also the dark figure attached to him. Nadalia does know that. A very few handful of gods would be able to see her attached to Belle. That was if they looked real close. Like they would have to take like focus on it for them to even for them to notice she was there. And that doesn't even go to the fact of actually not acknowledging but comprehending what she really is. Because, you know, I'll give you guys a little bit of thing, is that Manus was actually struck down by the gods, in a way. See, when it first came to the thing, is that mankind was under the heel of darkness, as it would be called. Manus was essentially the god of that darkness, the god of the world itself. While Orion, whose gods may have remained in the heaven, he was... Partly born of the earth, born of man. All their fears, their hates, everything that they were, he was sort of that god of. But he also had other emotions he was capable of since he was the god of man. He just was more of their worst aspects. And the gods up above were the gods that they worship for individual things. But when it came time for it, when the gods want to go upon the world and sort of mingle among mankind, Manus actually did not allow them to. He actively hunted and attacked many gods. 
and quite a few of them he actually was able to permanently kill. For instance, I'll say, like the Greek Pantheon. As far as I know, we know about Zeus, Aphrodite, Ares, Hestia, Hephaestus, and Soma, along with, what was it, uh, the Perseus, uh, Hermes, and Apollo. A lot of the Greek gods are still around. But I would direct it to the, like, sayings like the Norse, Celtic, like, gods, I would say, of lesser power. These gods from these, I, would, I don't mean, to, like, sound rude, but they were kind of lesser pantheons. They weren't as widespread religions. So, Manus was able to actually kill them. And that's why the main power in Arario is the Greek pantheon. So, as I was, as I digress, it actually came down to these group of gods. Zeus, Freya, Ganesha, as, and I would say Hephaestus made the weapons to fight Manus. And the final god to join them was actually Loki. So Freya and Loki, Zeus, Hephaestus, and what was his name? Ganesha. These six gods really came together. Six or five? Yeah, Hes Z not Hesia. Freya, Loki, Ganesha, Hephaestus, Zeus. These five really came together. Hephaestus armed them with some of the most powerful weapons she had actually ever crafted. To specifically kill Manus, she upgraded Zeus's lightning bolts. As I will say, it's a little bit closer to Greek mythology. And I'll say, scratch what I said about Freya being there. Loki joined in because she was the trickster and was able to use her special powers to sort of oh, like confuse Manus. Zeus was the raw power that they needed to overwhelm him. And Ganesha had abilities of his own that I don't know much about him, but I personally just like him as a god. Like I said, Hephaestus made the weapons. So, and I would say the last god to actually join this group was actually, I believe it's Thanatos? No, it's not Thanatos. Essentially, the first god to descend upon Arario, which was, I forget his name, but he's in the anime. He's like the god of the guild, essentially. He's their patron deity. I, but I digress. Essentially, these, these gods descended upon Manus one day when they had used Loki as bait to lure him into a trap. And since Loki isn't the most robust or powerful god or goddess, depending on... Because Loki, unbeknownst to some of you, maybe, was able to actually switch between being man and woman. It was like a favorite thing of theirs that they loved to do was shapeshift. So, as it came down to it, Zeus was able to strike from above. And now what? I'll... Re say what I said. The Thanatos God. I don't know if he's Thanatos. I'll say it was actually Hermes. With his speed, Hermes was able to overwhelm with quick strikes and the like, being the fastest of the gods. Loki used her illusions and all her shape shifting abilities to help confuse and strike at Manus. Hephaestus armed them, like I said, but she also fought. And I'll say, instead of like in most mythologies, that where she has her like eye patch covering, that's actually where Manus had actually harmed her and caused her face to be grossly disfigured. And Ganesha, I know he wears elephant like stuff. I don't know much about Ganesha, like I said, but I just like him, so he's there. He fought, like, hand-to-hand -hand with Manus, thinking that this was a great challenge, as you know, he's actually the one in charge of the 
games that are hosted. And like I said, Zeus is like the raw physical power. So as they all struck out at Manus, Manus was able to tear, like I said, he would hurt them bad. Even Zeus had a very hard time fighting Manus. And he almost died if it wasn't for Hephaestus when she got in the way and struck at Manus with a hammer that actually hit him so hard it pretty much started the point to where he would be broken and shattered. In a way, she attacked his very soul of his being with the hammer she made as he retaliated and marked her forever by disfiguring her face, Zeus and the rest of them were able to land the last telling strike that shattered him into his four pieces. There's Nishandra, Nadalia, there's the Squalid Queen, which she's in the other one, as well as the final one, but I forget her name. She is the ruler of the Kingdom of Ice that keeps the Chaos Flame at bay in Dark Souls 2. Nadalia, like I said, each of them represent a core piece to Manus. But each of them, like the rest of humanity, are capable of growth. It's just very hard because of their nature. And so when it came down to it, the gods were able to succeed in destroying Manus, but not the god he was. It just sort of separated out into multiple different pieces. And that's why Bell has to train so hard... And so that way he can stop a literal portion of a god, essentially. That was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with multiple... I would say class level. Loki isn't straight up, straight out powerful. Same thing with Hermes, but he's the fastest. And Hephaestus god-killing weapons, essentially, were a whole other thing as well. Zeus and Ganesha were the powerhouses, I'll say. And like I said, I don't know much about Ganesha, but I like him and I'm going to say he's strong. Let me have my moment. As it came down to it, Fre no, sorry, I was forgot where I was completely going with this. It was actually around the part where Nadali is trying to hide her presence from the gods that could see her and like see, like try and keep her more concealed than usual. Same thing with Belle. As they're walking around though, Freya is still very interested in Belle and wants to see what will become of him. She, unlike with the other gods that want to get mad, she actually watched the fight that happened and she loved the thrill that Manus, Manus sort of brought to her. It's a weird form of a crush she had on Manus because she saw that he... Her whole deal is that she loves the struggling of man. And to her, Manus was that epitome. Like the epitome. Epitome? The utmost that you could get when it came to struggle. Because she saw a deeper side to Manus. And that he was also one to constantly hold back. Though he was the pretty much the god of mankind's fears. And well, the god of humanity itself. She sort of saw it as he was everything that the highest potential mankind could ever reach. And now she dreams of the day that she could find a human that could ever hope to come close to Manus. And as she would put it, she would claim him as her own. She possibly thinks Belle may be this person because... Though she saw that darkness, she only felt like an inkling of it, but she could feel that it was almost like Manus was there. And that's where this whole next part is going to come into play. This has been a little bit of a long video, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this. And the next part will be her letting some things loose. But anyways, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. If you guys can choose, Joyce. Hope you guys have a nice day, nice night, nice life.